Meeting to order. Uh, so the first thing is to review and approve the agenda, and I don't believe we have any changes. I have something, oh, you, oh, you have something yes. an adjustment to make, and I apologize. This is slightly spacey on my <clears> behalf, <throat> but I got some last-minute round of my first round of uh, liquor license renewals. I've got uh, just a regular renewal from Mobile Mart. I've got a slightly different one uh, from Sodexo Operations. That's just a name change. So they had to refile another one. And uh, Capital Food Court, which is just the, the folks who run the uh, Capital uh, Cafeteria. They're always constantly sending me a million uh, uh, catering requests, and they just got recommended to just get their own local license, and life okay. will be better for them. So and so I this is add those to, to the consent agenda, sorry. Okay. Any um, objection to that change? Okay. Um, any other comments on the agenda? Okay, so without objection, we'll consider the uh, agenda approved. All right, so on to general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on a topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. Uh, welcome. Oh, and if you would say your name and where you live and try to keep your comments to about two minutes. Okay, I got the timer going. Uh, <laughs> Zach Hughes, Prospect Street, Montpelier. And my comments will be rather uh, brief on this subject, and I'll uh, defer my comments to later on other stuff. Um, I would like to um, offer special thanks um, uh, to Avon over in the uh, or the uh, community center downstairs here for her time on the homeless task force for assisting us in the beginning. I think her work with us was very valuable and um, we thank her for that. And uh, I'd like to wish uh, congratulations to Tony Fakos for his retirement. Uh, I'm sad to see you go, um, Chief Fakos. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? And is your comment related to something not on our agenda? It's about something that happened in the last council meeting okay. um, in regard to the funding of the recommendations of the Homelessness, homelessness Task Force, which I don't see here so that would be a part of our budget hearing so if you would say if it's even though it's then. about a comments made by a counselor in regard to said funding so generally speaking if it's something that's on our agenda it's, uh, unless it's, it's not unless really it's, it's kind of like just the sentiment of fine. what it's, was said i just thought, figured i'd check thank, thank you. you very yes. much yes so uh counselor if you would say your name and where you live laura rose Prospect Street, Montpelier. Counselor uh, Bate expressed um, the desire to not have homeless people come here. Should we fully fund the recommendations? I believe that she said that, you know, they come from different places. And if we had, you know, the sentiment was really to me that if we had really good services, that people might come here to be helped and that she didn't want to fund the recommendations um, in case that maybe people would come here because we do have open borders here in Montpelier. So if we had really great services for the homeless population, she was afraid that they might come from other places to take advantage of that. But I feel that maybe other counselors or maybe potential counselors could have a different feeling about homeless population in Montpelier, and that we could really set an example by allocating funding and making a difference in people's lives. Our small financial contributions could change lives. And I'm just wondering if other people feel like Counts Counselor Bate, not wanting to help the homelessness because there's a fear that more could come. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Ms. Rose, I'm, I'm sorry if that's how you felt about what I said. I was emphasizing, I even made the motion for the 45. 
$5,000 was I do feel we need to have a regional response that it's not just Montpelier and that we need a regional commitment including the financing, the programs, and the whole networking and re resolution. And I felt the regional approach was very important. Even though we started our own task force, I'm hoping we don't stop there, but that we end up networking financially and resources with the region. So I apologize if somehow that sounded right. like what I meant. You were talking about our funding of the proposal here locally, so it really did sound like you didn't want to help that segment. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm, all I can say is it isn't my intention. And that's why I made the motion for the funding. But I also feel like we shouldn't fund it 100%. That it is. That's all. Okay, we'll talk about it later. Thank you. Uh, Steve Whitaker, Montpelier. I'd like to just again raise the alarm about our uh, necessity for prioritizing public works maintenance. Uh, I know. Our director is working hard to get staffed up and rearrange and redesign that department. But when I repeatedly have to deal with folks and help folks walk along a section of sidewalk that's too covered with ice, um, and I'm saying this not in the sense of criticism of the work she's doing, but in the sense of the, the need to prioritize for the council to <laughs> not always focus on year out, three year, five year aspirational stuff, but work on the immediate public safety quality of life issues, like getting the garbage out of the pocket park and like uh, taking care of ice and hazards. So that's brief enough, but you get my point. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Okay. All right. So we'll um, uh, move on to the consent agenda. Uh, Jack. Move the consent agenda. I want to pull the necessity resolution. Uh, yes. Well, um, yeah, we should. So um, with the consent agenda, I think we are um, should probably pull the necessity resolution as, as I think we need to talk about that. And we can talk about that when we get to the bond, the bond hearing um, discussion, which is item seven. Um, so I move the consent agenda as amended. I'll second. <clears throat> okay. Uh, any, and this includes uh, John's item. Yeah. Okay. Any further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Um, thank you all for that. And uh, so we have a, a presentation or, or an update, really, uh, for, about uh, Five Home Farm Way. Uh, welcome. Sit yeah. mm -hmm. <clears throat> And if you'd make sure to just speak into the microphone and yep. introduce yourself. <laughs> Hi, Jamie Duggan, representing the Two Rivers Partnership. Thank you for uh, your time this evening and the place on the agenda. Um, <clears throat> I submitted my report. Uh, I'm sure as you read the beginning part of it, uh, there was no new news, but um, Councilor McCulloch uh, requested or reiterated the interest in a written report and uh, something also that the public could access. So I felt it was important to provide a little bit of context to begin with just to sort of uh, for those following along. Uh, the progress, I guess, that I can report uh, is that we have uh, signed a letter of engagement with legal counsel. Uh, Jeff Polabinski is uh, heading up the, uh, the team. And um, they have been uh, at work over the last few weeks doing uh, research on um, title and deed, uh, the, the easements, uh, rights of way, and other uh, instruments that are in place. Uh, I am hoping that we'll be able to meet um, as soon as next week to get a sense of sort of what what lies ahead or what some of our options are. And uh, we're at a point now, we've had plenty of time to um, get prepared. So once we sort of have uh, a sense of where we're going, our intent <coughs> is to continue to keep moving forward um, in uh, at least the first goal of acquiring uh, ownership, achieving ownership. So, uh, any questions for Jamie? Uh, a short one. So you mentioned you uh, engaged a lawyer, and yep. you feel that he will be able to get this property deed figured out. I believe so. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Is it? I mean, is it more than a title search? Is it? 
It's a complex situation uh, and uh, dealing with a lot of property law. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, we've, we've been working through it a little bit. Um, and yes, uh, Jeff has, specializes in real estate law and uh, dealing with development and environmental uh, considerations as well, all sort of part of that parcel. So I, I am. I, it, it, we, um, it, we tried to be very careful about um, whom we wanted to work with because of the complexity and just to ensure um, that you know our resources were being spent wisely. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Any other questions? Okay, well, I'm certainly looking forward to the next report, and um, and well, I'm just glad that uh, you know y'all have taken that step, and that it sounds like we're moving forward. Um, that's it's very encouraging, and uh, if at any point along the way, you know, there's any anything that you need from us, certainly let us know. No, I, so, thank you. Yeah, thank I appreciate you. the continued support. And we'd be looking at April for the next. I'm sorry. E I'm sorry. We'd be looking at April for. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> so it would be the 8th or the 22nd, and the 22nd yeah. is school vacation week. I guess. Oh, it is, yes. Oh, okay. So maybe the 8th, is that? Yep. I'll keep an eye out for that. And I do I do hope that I have a, a, a bit more of a robust report right. at that time. Well, yes. and that's it's all good. <laughs> yep. But I appreciate your you know continued support and uh, patience with the process. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Great. Thanks. Thank Thanks you. for coming. Are helpful. Thank you. Yeah. It's good that you're coming back. Okay, so we are up to the uh, bond discussion, and uh, at least as uh, was on the agenda, it was about the rec center, um, and I'm going to turn this over to Bill to sure. um, talk about. So I've uh, got a couple of things. I do have some numbers that you had asked to see, so I, I can flash them quickly up on the uh, screen. And we do have another uh, budget item, as you saw, that just came in after our last meeting uh, for 134000 uh, to repay the state for land purchase. So we should talk about that. Um, we're going to recommend for staff uh, that we postpone the, the bond vote on the um, rec center until November. Sorry, John. Um, <laughs> Uh, in large part, um, unfortunately, uh, well, it's, it's not funny, actually, for those that, that were at the hearing the other night, the, the work session, uh, one of the two gentlemen who's leading, the, in fact, the gentleman who's leading the project, uh, unfortunately, passed away two days after our public session and uh, from, the, from Breadloaf, the lead design person. So they're scrambling to replace him, and he really was the font of the knowledge. So. I think we feel that we're not going to be able, if we were to really have to roll out information and have public sessions and those kind of things, that we would be at a bit of a disadvantage to try to do that between now and March. Um, so just in terms of the public interest and the ability for, to digest this and communicate issues. But nonetheless, I do have um, information about the, the bond numbers nonetheless. So I'll be happy to you give me a second to get set up. Is that still of value to you all? based on the fact that we might do this in November and not, well, actually, do, do the numbers that you have reflect a bond in, in November? It, it reflects bonds. I think it would be useful for people to just to see. Okay. It shouldn't take, it doesn't take very long. Great. And Great. it let's, also let's talks about the other issue. Cool. Thank you. So. <coughs> Something's happening. So while we're waiting for this to Come on. Um, I, I'll talk briefly about the other $134,000. You may recall the city purchased three properties um, from uh, near where Montpelier Beverage was and the, home, the uh, Vermont Center for the Blind and Independent, uh, Visually Impaired, and the other parking lot, the TKS property, uh, with federal funds to develop the one Taylor project. And then when we were uh, going to um, have, have private development there, in order for that to happen, the state declared part of that as surplus property uh, so that we could then sell it to, uh, it's actually going to, to, that to be the Moat Trust. Um, and we were made aware at the time that we needed to repay 
those sur those federal funds, and of course we were planning to repay it with the proceeds from the sale. And then when we chose, or actually they chose not to, um, Anyway, we, we chose not when, when the deal didn't go through. Uh, we then were, be, were made aware. Actually, we thought it was going to be 167,000, but I guess our share, or the federal share, is 134,000, and um, that was partly understood. You may recall the state provided an additional 1.2 million in federal funds to complete that project. So we've known for a couple of years that we were going to have to pay this bill, and they had said they'd give us some time, but hadn't specified the exact time due on that. Uh, and then last Friday, after our budget hearing, I got, I got a note from the state saying, um, here's the number and we need it by December of this year. So obviously, that's money we don't have in the budget. Um, and there's no real project budget for um, the Confluence Park or any other development there. and. We've put on hold the notion that we would, um, that we would, I'm sorry, I'm trying to do too many things at once here. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so two potential bonds or financings, one uh, for 5.2 million, uh, the estimated project for the rec center, and the other was the land repayment that I started to fumbly uh, discuss. Um, that we have that is due back to the state. I have since uh, just continuing on that thought while while it's up there. I have asked some for some clarifying questions from the state, such as could we move it to the next fiscal year? Uh, <coughs> what happens if we don't pay it? If we do pay it, does that mean we then own the property outright and have no further obligations to transportation funds, or are there still continued strings and those kind of things, and have not yet uh, received <laughs> responses? Going back to the uh, recreation center, if we the impact on the budget, so the first year of a bond, uh, depending when we issue it, it would be 114,000, about 1.3 cents on the tax rate if we were just to do it that way. Uh, the year two, 302,000, uh, so that's just under three and a half cents, and then year three and thereafter it would declines from 300. So, so the year two is the highest payment. So if we were just to put that on the tax rate, that's what it would look like. If we were to look at it in our capital plan, we had a lot of discussion about this at the last meeting, and I think it was a little confusing. So here's our capital plan as it sits right now. The bold is what's proposed for this, this current budget, or the FY21 budget. So you can see the total is 2.4 million, and 515,000 of that is equipment. We've got just under $600,000 of, of debt that we'll be paying, leaving us a balance of $1.285 million to do our annual projects with. That's our road, uh, you know, roads, retaining walls, sidewalks, um, storm sewers, those kinds of things. All the, all the things that, you know, facilities, all the things that show up in the capital project list. Uh, as you can see, that's an increase of 100,000 over last year because uh, not only did, are we putting 25,000 more in, but debt dro is dropping off from last year's 683. You can see if there were no additional debt in the general fund, uh, the debt payments drop down um, on about $300,000 between now and FY30, so the annual funding continues <coughs> rising without us putting any more into the, the capital plan. You, I've actually factored a little bit into the equipment plan <coughs> because that's been flat for so long and we're falling behind. But the, the annual and debt funding would just continue rising on its own, left, left to its own devices. If we were to put um, a, a plan where we put that first $114,000 payment in this current budget that we're talking about, you can see uh, that we go, uh, our debt goes up to 713000 and our annual drops down to $1.1 million. So it's about the same as last year. And then, uh, it, it, then the following year, of course, the $300,000 uh, starts kicking in and, and everything else, but it's offset by the, the drop-offs. Um, so that you can see, I'm trying to, I can't really see well enough here to go backward um, to just, here we go, just there. So that's what it looks like currently. This is what it looks like if we were to, to have the 
debt payment in this current budget. If we were to have the debt payment not start till the next year's budget, then obviously we would stay the same this year, and then they would, the money would start hitting in the future years. However, we would still have um, 1.2 some odd million in FY22 for annual funds, um, which is you know more than the what we would have at 1.08, uh, but less than the 1.4. I mean, it just makes sense. We're adding 100,000 and then 300,000 into this total money, so it just shows how it would lay out the impact on, on those projects. And I think, I think those were the kind of things we were trying to figure out in our heads last week. And here, these are the actual numbers. And then if we were just taking the land purchase, if we were just to pay it this year, <laughs> either add it to the budget or whatever, it would be at one point, equivalent of 1.5 cents. We did, this is rough, this isn't with the bond bank, but, but uh, we did a, just an Excel cal calculation. And so it'd be roughly 29,000 plus for five, if we borrowed it over five years and about 15,000 or 16,000 over 10 years. Uh, so minimal impact. Um, if we were to do that, of course, we end up paying a fair amount of interest on that, and we have those calculations. Uh, but depending on whether or not we have full, you know, that if we have full control of the property, then it gives us full control over uh, its future, whether we make it green space or whether we make it, you know, private development space or whatever. Um, and that's one of the things I don't know about is like what happens if we pay this back, then the land appreciates, we sell it at a private sale. Do, do we get the windfall? Does, you know, do we split? I don't, I don't understand yet. So that's all I have really on bonds, <laughs> just to see how, how they fit in there. Uh, Donna. So do, do we need to make a decision of this 130000 that's related to the land for paying back the feds as we make a decision about the budget? Well, we need to, well, yes, I think, we, at least how we're gonna approach it, we, we need to pay it back by December 1 of 2020. So that would so, be in this current budget year, or the year we're planning for, FY21. So, and that is new information since last week. Um, and, you know, unless they come back and say, well, you can wait till the following year. My hunch is the state is doing their budget and they can use this repayment of money to match federal funds. So they could probably match about a million dollars with this money, uh, which is good. I mean, the state transportation funds could use that and they certainly provided that to us. So my hunch is that they're doing their budget and they need it for their FY21 budget, which is why the ask. Okay, so my question comes, if we have to make a decision along with this budget, then I'm, I'm, I have a question about the option of five year and 10 year. Mm -hmm. Because then you made the statement you'd have to ask the feds if they would let us pay us back at that rate? No, no, no. No, we would take a note or a bond. We'd put it and on a ballot. We'd pay it in full. We, we would pay it in full and just then repay the debt on it for the short period of time if we chose to do it that way. <laughs> okay, so then what was your comment about we'd have to ask the feds? Maybe I misunderstood. Oh, what I'd like to, what I, I'm trying to get clarity from the feds is if we do this, does that end any and all restrictions? So if we were to choose okay. to then make it a development right. project and sell the land and it comes in at more than 167,000 or 134,000, do we, do we owe, and do we have a continual obligation in that appreciation of the land value to them, or is that if we've paid this off? Title, free and clear, right? Right. Okay. <laughs> but what we do know is we have to pay this. Yes, thank you. So just to add a, a little bit to the conversation, and we can talk about this more, I think maybe when we get to the budget. Yeah. Um, but uh, without counting the CVPSA, um, at this point, we're at 4%, and if we added uh, the 10-year um, option, um, then, actually, let me get the exact number. It's 1571. <clears throat> um, then that takes us to 4.2, right. um, which is... Or we could find 15,000 to yeah. take out. Um, which could be, you know, other capital plan, could right. be... Um, okay. Uh, so, any other questions about uh, this information so far? Yes. So, 
maybe we're going to talk about this um, related to for the rec center. So if we're pushing it off till November, is there still potential <coughs> allocation for this year that would also be competing in terms of preparation, or is there work that we would be paying for for this, for this fiscal no, so year the, the, this that, that implicate that somehow would play into well the that only overall piece of information that would be helpful on this that I don't think we'll have, but we might have by August. There is an August primary as well, or uh, the November election it would be um, the downtown master plan, and, and that the expansion of that master plan was actually prompted by this particular piece of property when um, there was a con you know a, a difference of opinion whether it should be remained open and green or whether it should be developed as a you know a private taxable development and uh, we had a working group talking about that and the conclusion was instead of instead of focusing on this property as one property let's look at it in the whole and what the needs of the downtown are and so that is when we expanded our downtown master plan study from just state street to state and and maine and the full Downtown. So at some point, presumably, this this land will be addressed in that plan. Now, if we were to sell it, we would recoup. I'm very confident we'd recoup this money, and it's just a question of whether we would realize more pre appreciation. Uh, and that had been our initial plan for how to repay this. Uh, was we had a deal. We were going to sell it to the Moat Trust. They were going to pay us. We were going to pay the state back with this. All said and done, that deal f went apart the la at the closing. They chose to just sell us the land and not buy this property. So that gave us a whole new set of, of decisions. And the council at that point said, we'd like to look at potential green space, you know, or both options. And I think at, we made clear, and I think the the sense at the time was if, if this were to be an expanded confluence park or something like that, that this is a cost that needs to be built into the, the creation of that parkland. But I don't think we're going to have funding for that park by December uh, to, to and, and even the funding we're talking about is on the other side of the river. It's not this side. So I, I don't, you know, it just doesn't seem realistic that even if we, we were to purchase it now and seek to get ourselves paid back or just call this a contribution to that parkland, that there will be a specific direction for that come December, unless the decision is let's put it back on the private market and see what happens and redevelop it. Can you actually go back to um, this slide before the uh, rec building? This is... Oh, well, I guess it's... I'm thinking about, like, if... Because if we put it on this... Oh. Right, yeah. Uh, right, this one. Yep. Yep. Um, $114,000. Anyway, I just wanted to have that number in my head so that you know when we get to conversation about the budget, um, maybe we can be talking about that. Um, unless we want to make decisions about um, this aspect of the budget right now. I'm, I'm usually inclined to like take it all together, but I'm open to other things, yeah. It, it sounds as though from your presentation that there, there are enough questions about that we still don't know the answers to that we're it's not going to make t sense to me to decide what to do with this hundred thirty four thousand dollars tonight and we could well decide we'll probably be deciding what to do at our next budget hearing uh, on the 23rd um, looking at uh, at the figures that you presented it looks as though if we if we spread the uh, repayment over by in debt over five years or ten years we'd be looking at roughly twelve thousand dollars or sixteen thousand dollars in interest uh, depending the, on which for the deferral of that uh, payment yeah yeah I mean we just guessed at three percent we don't know what the actual rate would be mm -hmm. but that's about what the bond <coughs> bank is going right now but but so yeah so my, my thinking is that it, this is very good information to have but uh, we're probably the only the only issue to keep in mind is if we if we choose to do this and use financing, then if we want to do it in March, we need to hold a public hearing on it. We need to have a necessity resolution. So one of the reasons we suggested pulling the necessity resolution was if we wanted to 
if we weren't going to do the rec center, but we wanted to change the, it to this, to at least adopt that, to give us that option, we could do so. Um, if, if you think you're not going to deal with this till August or November, then we don't have to do anything with it. But it is, so it's just we do have formalities to be sure to do um, if we're going to if we're going to even consider having this as a March item. If we're going to bond it, there's no particular benefit to the city to doing it in March as opposed to August or November. No, other than the, no, not really. I guess the only issue for the city would be is if it didn't pass. And so if we waited until November and the bills due December 1, and we tell them, sorry, we don't have well, the money. Well, leave that, or yeah. we'd have to pay it out of other funding yep. that we, you know, and um, that would, it would be cutting it from some other place. So that, that would, that's the risk, is knowing the certainty of whether we have the funds available. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's part of the questions to the state, right? Because right. if we don't um, pay them, then uh, do they, take do the they get the title, and then they could sell it. Or do whatever they want. With their own process, um, which is all, seems also possible. Um, just to take this a little, oh, I, um, well, I guess I had another question out there um, about were there any, um, you know, do you want to decide about anything now regarding this? I mean, so one one thing that I could picture doing right now is deciding, like, do you, do you picture doing any of this in March, um, or do you picture doing any of this in August or November, or not at all? Boy, that repayment looked looked kind of far in the future when we first talked about it, didn't it? Uh, Glenn. Um, Jack's comments uh, persuade me that I don't think we have to do it tonight. Uh, August feels like a reasonable timeline to me. Um, and and if I were if I were making the decision tonight, I think I would be in favor of trying the, the five year repayment. But uh, I'm glad to have the information. Uh, but yeah, I don't I don't think that we should try for it in March. Other thoughts, Connor? Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm in the same place. If we could get more information to make an intelligent decision on this, uh, no harm in pushing it back to mm -hmm. August at least. Donna? <laughs> I would tend not to push it back, but the, that's all. But I, it's fine. Yeah. Other thoughts? <laughs> Go ahead, Lauren. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think August makes sense to me. Give us time to just make get that full information. We don't have some answers to And we may have it questions. by next week, for all I know. But, mm -hmm. um, but August seems <clears throat> reasonable. Mm -hmm. But we otherwise don't have to decide tonight. Jack, anything to add? Um, nope. Okay. Okay. Any other questions about uh, the bond, either of these bonds, at this point? Okay. Well, we'll look forward to more information about um, at least the um, TKS property. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not going to go too far because budget's coming right up, right? <clears throat> yeah. Right. Yeah. It's right next door. Okay. So that was the um, bond discussion. Um, so on to the. Well, what would have been the bond public hearing? Um, but if there's no bonds being proposed, we don't need one. That, right, we don't have any bonds at the moment. So can you take a comment on that? Anyway? Sure, sure, yeah. Because I think it was warned for yeah, yeah. on an adopted agenda. No, that's fine. I was thinking about we should probably open the public hearing anyway. Um, so <laughs> Yeah, especially before you about took a vote. Right, so, so I'm going to officially open a public hearing on this. Uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, First, I want to thank you for the noise reduction of the computer room uh, and rhetorically ask what took you so long. Uh, but it is nice to be able to hear from the back of the room. Um, the, the rec center, uh, what I see is us continuing to look at bonding before we've got a handle on the scale of the deferred maintenance of our sidewalks and roads. I mean, we're, we're living in a future we dream about Montpelier becoming, uh, and we're not taking care of what I would see as a decade of deferred maintenance. And I don't know if you're anticipating uh, water main replacement that keeps blowing out. You know, the sidewalk repairs 
road repairs, potentially fiber zone, Wi-Fi zone downtown. These are things that we need now and that don't seem to be in our discussion yet. So as capital improvements, I would ask us to take a slow enough approach to where we get the full, I don't think that planning has been done of how many feet of sidewalk, yards of sidewalk, how many sections of road, how many sections of water main are vulnerable to blow out this winter, next winter. Because every time that happens, that totally derails the operation of our public works department. And all hands on deck, all other priorities diverted. So I'm, I'm a, I think I can, I can be more forceful in saying that, you know, we need to put some real focus on what are the costs and the potential liabilities of the number, the dollars and the scale of dollars of deferred maintenance that we need to catch up on. I don't know how big the problem is with the water mains. I just know it keeps blowing out. So that's a caution. I don't think that VTrans is going to grab the property in November uh, because uh, just by fiat or foreclosure. So. Thank you. Um, I do have some comments related to that, but they're more pertaining to the budget, so I'm going to hold on to them until we get to the budget. Um, any other comments um, from the public about uh, the bonds, or potential bonds? Okay. Um, all right, so I'm going to close the public hearing, and then uh, moving on to the uh, the, bu the the budget public hearing. So I'm going to open the public hearing uh, related to the budget. Um, and Bill, did you want to give a, a presentation on this? Uh, yeah, I've just got an overview here. I'll just get it pulled up here. <clears throat> Won't take very long. Also. This is basically an updated version of the, the presentation we did when we presented the budget to you, only now uh, including the, the discussions that you've had. Uh, this is the first public hearing on the proposed budget. Council can still make changes. They preliminarily adopted this budget, but have tonight and next week to make final changes before it goes on the ballot. Uh, the budget goals are to implement the strategic plan that the council goes through in the spring, continue our capital and equipment funding plan uh, for those issues such as streets and sidewalks, et cetera, to deliver our services. And we had a major challenge with insurance costs this year. Can I, before you, actually one of my questions was related to that. The continuing the capital and equipment funding plan, um, this, in, I, I recall at the end of last year, we were still $25,000 from um, fully funding all of our infrastructure. And does this, does this budget include that, that, yes. that increase? So we are increasing our capital um, plan by $25,000 right. to so the total sufficiently maintain the, all of our infrastructure. Right, that was based on the steady state plan that did look at the segments of sidewalks and streets. And, uh, and then we have a separate one for sewer, water and sewer. That's a longer term plan. But the total funding for for capital plus debt payments plus equipment this year is 2.4 million <laughs> out, of, out of our total budget. Okay. Um, so I, this is just outline of our strategic planning fam framework. We'll go through that in detail. Uh, but breaking into, into its capacity, we take a look at how our, our um, how our budget relates to the items identified by the council. So we have $100,000 in funding for the Montpelier Development Corporation. We've maintained our planning and zoning staff, and we continue to implement our TIF district, hopefully. Uh, for environmental stewardship, we have uh, 5,000 for MEAC. We've we have stormwater projects included in the capital plan. We've got the 40,000 for the circulator bus, which could be also for micro transit instead. Uh, and 35,000 in the capital plan for our energy plan. Uh, for our inclusive, equitable, and welcoming community, we have 130,000 for our community fund. We awarded that 
those those grants at the last meeting. We've included $10,000 for our social equity contract work. We've got our feast program at the Senior Center. We're funding Montpelier Alive again at 32,000. We have our community enhancements. And at the last meeting, you had $45,000 for homelessness uh, services. For sustainable infrastructure, we did increase the funding for the capital and equipment plan. We're continuing funding for our water and sewer plan, uh, and then we made a couple of staff changes to try to uh, put more people where we need work. Uh, thoughtfully planned built environment. We continue the downtown improvement district. We continued funding for downtown projects in our capital plan, and we had $20,000 for the public art commission. We may retain $110,000 for the Housing Trust Fund. And again, we've got our TIF plan in place. For public health and safety, we've added the social worker in the public works department. Uh, we've anticipated a big year for public events. We've continued our paramedic program in the fire department, our project safe catch uh, in the police department. And we actually have, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but um, some pretty great news in that department for our community this year. Um, and uh, we now have added the CVPSA ballot item for uh, communications. In our responsive and responsible government, we even continue our communications efforts, our employee wellness. We're keeping our service levels. We, you know, we haven't cut any any operations. Uh, and our bridge article for communications uh, is, stays in the budget. So taking a look at our strategic plan, we talked about possibly upgrading street lights to LED. We have the light purchase in the capital plan. The bonding would be for all the wiring and everything else. And as you know, we, we may come back with that later in the year. And, and the idea is that would pay for itself. CSO projects are in the capital plan. So again, I, just to remind not so much the council, but people watching, these items were all items that in March and April, the council said, these are things we want to talk about this year and we'll need to address them in the budget. So now we're at the budget and going. we're checking ourselves. Uh, so the equity consultant is in the budget. The downtown master plan is being completed and the, the funding for coordinated signals is in the uh, CIP. The emergency management funding is increased slightly. Uh, we had a plan for alternative fuels. Uh, we have a police hybrid on order. Um, Parking garage operations, obviously, we did not include that in the budget until we know when the garage is actually going to be built and opened. Housing trust fund, we had 110,000. We increased infrastructure. Um, we have not really changed much with our personnel plan. We have not got that to you yet. We're still hoping to do it before March. We'll see. Uh, we have the social worker in. We chose not to do the public Wi-Fi due to the cost. The recreation center, we're still talking about. The Confluence Park, we approved 20000 at the last meeting, and that is in the capital plan. And there's no firm place for, plan in place for Sabin's Pasture, so no funding uh, associated with it. So these are things that are included that since you've talked about it. Uh, and then we still have, those are the things that we've talked about that are not yet included anywhere. Uh, just very quickly, just snapshot, this is where our money comes from to fund the general fund. Again, this is not counting the water and sewer fund or funds that come from other sources. This is the key government operation, so about two-thirds of it is property tax. Uh, and then our other funding, and here's where we spend the money. Uh, again, more than half of it is on our people. They do a lot of our work. You can see 12% is our capital plan and debt, and then when included with the equipment at 16%. Um, and then just breaking that down by more function as opposed to the general, the big categories, you can see where the money goes. <laughs> so uh, all in all, we have a property tax rate that is, uh, 5.1 cent increase, 4.5%. Average tax bill is $116. Uh, the water and sewer rates are being adjusted as per the long-term plan, and uh, no change is required for our sewer and CSO benefits. So our process is tonight we have a public hearing. Next Thursday we have our final public hearing. And in March we will have voting from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. with early voting to start in mid-February. And that's the overview of the budget. Okay, so I believe I've already uh, opened the public hearing uh, for this uh, topic. Uh, so 
Uh, Councilors have anything to say first, and then and we'll go to the public. Yeah, go ahead. I think I'm still a little uncomfortable with the $100,000 to the MDC. I know, like, the bulk of that appropriation <coughs> goes towards the executive director position, which I think has been vacant for probably about six months now. So I, I think I would really like to see some numbers on that, get a better handle of what the MDC is doing right now. Because, again, it's a good chunk of change right there. It's, I'm not, I'm not comfortable voting for the full 100000 at this point. Good point. I think it's worth finding out um, what their need is and if uh, this is a – I would think that it is easier to take something out – well, how, how should I say this? We did make a commitment to them for five years, and if this is something that we're going to reduce, I think it probably ought to go to some kind of one-time fee uh, so that we can anticipate that we're going to honor our commitment. Th that's just uh, – yeah, I, I, I think I'm also a little uncomfortable with like making five-year commitments when it's two-year yeah. council terms. It's uh, <laughs> good I, point. I didn't commit anything. <laughs> true, true, fair. Um, how? What? Are you, what is uh, the other thoughts on getting some information or on that item, Glenn? Um, I think it'd be great to get more information. Uh, I uh, spoke with the MDC director myself uh, uh, maybe a month back or so, Lisa Maxwell. Um, Am I getting that name right? Mm -hmm. yep. uh, and uh, it was really helpful to me just to talk to her in person. I think it would be great to have her here kind of for a check-in um, and uh, follow up on that. I am, I think, relatively comfortable with the uh, number as it is, but it has <coughs> been kind of a question mark for me the whole time, and it's true, you know, neither you nor I were, were there when, when the five-year commitment was made. So I think we should, and they have had uh, <coughs> gaps in staffing. So it makes sense to, to check in. General agreement over there? OK. Uh, OK, let's, let's plan we, on that. Yeah, go ahead, Donna. I, I thought we've asked one of them to come in before. And I realize I didn't follow up, because they were, were, were without staff before and we sort of wanted to see the budget. So definitely I think we're overdue to hear from them. Yeah, fair. So let's let's see if we can get them in here next next uh, public hearing and and we'll go from there. Um, any other comments? Uh, Jack. Um, I feel like I should know the answer to this, but I don't so I'm asking for myself and for a constituent um, with regard to the, we're, we're budgeting for the controls for the uh, signals downtown, and I have a constituent who lives on Barry Street. He's interested in, well, what the timeline is for the controls and for the signal at uh, the Barry Street intersection. I think we'll have to get back to you on that. Okay. It's Thanks. you know it's in the budget, but we're not sure when we'd exactly be doing the okay. work. So. Anything else? Okay, uh, comments from the public. Hi, Erica Rail. Um, I forget where I live now. Um, Barry <laughs> City, representing Montpelier, representing the Homelessness Task Force. Um, I know there's concern in the budget about the money we're asking for. And I am also a Barry City resident. And I have to say that, first of all, thank you for even considering the money that you're giving us or thinking about giving us. Um, and it's been able to open doors and to talk to other cities, um, which is phenomenal. It's opening up doors to talk to Barry City and saying, hey, Montpelier's doing this and thinking about this. And why don't you guys think about this as well? And so I know there is some concern and about Montpelier uh, leveraging all this money, but it's a pilot. We're starting things, and it's starting to move and shake, and people saying, oh, Montpelier's doing it. Let's tack on, tack on what Montpelier's doing. And people are starting to start talking, and it's talking about a very serious issue that's affecting a lot of other towns. So yes, it's a lot of money. It's you know, increasing taxes for a lot of people, but it's also helping a lot of people. 
and eventually Montpelier might not be you might be able to take this money as seed money and helping a lot more people so thank you thank you <laughs> Zach Hughes <clears throat> Montpelier so uh, we started this out as a little well let's start back in uh, I actually been doing the work for a long time around around Montpelier with a bunch of people, Don here, uh, Erica, and um, but this work's been going on for a while. And uh, in July, I was in Washington D.C. Unfortunately, I wish I'd been up here, but I wasn't. And uh, it came to my attention that there was a here there was a you know some concern with business owners in the city and all this and it really um it turned into this task force finally um and i think um and then the task force kind of came together and we uh, have come up with some really good ideas um and i could say we're actually doing some uh, great work in there and <clears throat> and i can say that there has been you know, healthy criticism. I get that that happens, um, but I still think we're doing the work. And uh, but we we're also um, very invested in what we do because we we're still doing our work. Uh, you know, some of us are still doing the work outside the task force. Um, you know, so it's really cool that we're able to do that and to be able. And Montpelier shares a very unique opportunity here. Um, they could be the first, you know, city to to do this um, in the area here. Uh, and I agree with counselors here who think it should be a mutual uh, effort with the other cities. I agree with that. Um, and I think that, you know, it's it's money well spent. I was out there the other night. And uh, in fact, in front of a business, working with somebody, talking with somebody who was just transiting through the area, and I was trying, just trying to figure out where they were going. Um, and so, this is kind of the thing that we would want to be able to do, uh, you know, so that it doesn't cause any issues with businesses. And I think that's just great. Just talking with the person, being there, is critical. And I think that's what, and being able to connect with the person is critical. Um, I think it's um, that would be the difference between the social worker and the. Uh, the street workers, the street workers able to uh, get in there. And, you know, and based on lived experience um, in um, peer support, the reason I'm bringing this here tonight is because the weather was preventing me from getting down here last couple of times. Um, so I just really want to lay that out. And um, I uh, really do appreciate the city's, um, you know, uh, mount that they uh, ca that we came up with and, and I continue to uh, support the community's work and the city's work and appreciate the city's um, city council's willingness to really look at this issue and I can say that we too believe that we should share the uh, burden um, I also like to remind the council I was just talking with my board one of the boards I'm on today about this is that if it wasn't for <laughs> nonprofits uh, the city would be picking up a, a larger uh, portion of the cost because the nonprofits out there are doing a lot of the work and I think that's really important so for now I'll let this go and we'll see where this goes thank you thank you I'm Don Little again with the Montpelier Task Force. I don't know if this is the appropriate time, but I wanted to respond to a concern that Donna brought up briefly toward the end of the last meeting. Um, and you had said, um, I'm trying to trying to figure out how you put it, but you were saying that you know the street the street outreach is good for as a band aid, and you were talking about the need to look at the long term as well as at the band aid. And I couldn't agree with you more. I think that's something that all of us need to see happen and I'm hoping that we will have some time the task force will now have some time freed up to look at it but obviously that sort of thing takes longer to do um, but I also wanted to point out that 
in over the past couple of years, street outreach has partnered with the continuum of care and the existing agencies or you know, the experts, and that there are a number of people who were out on the streets who are now permanently housed. Um, and just to point out that the outreach can be flexible depending on the specific needs of the community and that we are often the people who will get the neediest people in contact with the, esper the experts and support them through the process. So in addition to being a Band-Aid and handing out sleeping bags, we also do look at getting people into long-term housing. You know, we're probably not the people who are going to design that and answer the big questions, but helping to facilitate it to happen. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Steve Whitaker, I'd like to uh, commend your willingness to put forty-five thousand in the budget. Uh, I'd still encourage you to go to fifty-six, uh, and I'll tell you why. But what I see is, you you recall, I leaned on you a long time to create the task force. I resigned. I feel like the task force is loaded with folks that are accepting of status quo that there's no vision, there's no direction in the proposal of how to spend $50,000. I think that would be a huge missed opportunity. I'd rather hold the money back and wait to use it as matching funds, but the, the proposal to fund just street outreach, porta potties and lockers is seriously not what we need. We, we need to put people into shelter, even if it's modest, very modest, low-cost shelters. And this is where I think the opportunity is. We could we could set a, a statewide model by adopting some of these, the pod concept where you have privacy in an indoor, you put a number of pods in a building with shared bathroom facilities, or the huts, the insulated huts in an outdoor facility. Th both of those have extreme potential to break the mold of warehousing people on a common basement floor. The, the accelerating mental illness that I see, uh, maybe I'm not qualified to call it illness, but it's mental distress that I'm seeing among the folks. I've been doing street outreach to a degree. Don does a whole lot more, Zach does his, you know, but I would hate to squander 30 or $50,000 uh, maintaining it, it. It is true that it's nice to give people help, but I think a half time street outreach worker would be a sufficient use of a portion of the budget you're willing to make. I think you really need to commit to investing in a plan and demand a plan. And a plan would explore brick and mortar housing for uh, parents, single par parents with children, uh, emergency, I've got my mind, uh, got my eye on two buildings that are available or that are potential uses for these. I don't want to put them into the public record yet. Uh, if you're on the street, a porta potty is counterproductive. I mean, it, it is not heated. There's no hot water. There's no wash up. And when you're living in the street, you need to thoroughly wash up after you use. So it's this is this is a band aid approach. Please do not waste fifty thousand dollars of precious money by not being very specific about what you expect back from that. So uh, we need real bathrooms. You could insist on a study of all the available bathrooms that could potentially be negotiated for twenty-four access, twenty-four hour access. City Hall's bathrooms. I've spoken to the police chief. And he hadn't considered the fact that the back door here could be put on an electric lock. You could buzz over to the dispatcher. The dispatcher could buzz you in if there's no motion on the motion sensor. I, that's a question for your electrician. Do the motion sensors that turn off the lights in these bathrooms, could they be triggered so that you know whether a person is still in there or not? Um, to, a trigger for, I think the real fear of making bathrooms available and supervised is of an overdose. Just let's acknowledge that and just put in protections. But allowing these city hall bathrooms, which are handicapped accessible, uh, hot water, et cetera, they're, they're an ideal solution and we haven't explored it. Letting people in without and nowhere beyond is possible. Um, camping, 
I've suggested in some of the other things I've written that Peace Park is one option. But again, we could commission the plan to require a study of alternatives for trailer-based uh, bathrooms that do have inclu included plumbing. I know some communities have built buses where people can shower. I know I'm not the only one that went over two minutes. I'm not worried about it. Um, I may cut you off at five. Yeah, I know. Yes. Okay. <laughs> But my point is, we need to be building privacy and dignity, and I, I am somewhat sobered by the homelessness events in the State House today. It's, y'all aren't the only ones lacking vision. <laughs> uh, so if that's any comfort. Uh, there's a lot of folks that are shooting for the stars. We want full private apartments for folks, and we won't do anything else. And that is just too far of a reach for the immediate need on the street today. We have people that need shelter that don't fit into the basement of Bethany, and they, they really need some modest shelter adjoining bathrooms, and we could do that. And the pods, Yes Tomorrow is willing to cooperate this spring on pods and, and huts. We could do set a model that actually creates a business here. Home Farm Road as well. Home Farm Road. And you're at about five minutes, just so you know. Yeah. If you, any, any final thoughts? No. Okay. No, they're not final. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, Home Farm Road is also an ideal possibility, that, an idea that be, could be fleshed out. They've already got jobs available for Agway and Dog River, and there's water and sewer there. You don't need a certificate of occupancy in the building to allow people to camp there. Okay. So, Th thank you, Stephen. Why am I the only one to get cut off? Just because you're tired of, you know? No, it's, there's uh, lot, lots of folks we, that would like to say something. Yes, hello. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, I'm sure a lot of you guys know my face. Um, my name is Karen Asensio. I started working with the Good Samaritan Haven down um, at the Bethany Church two months ago now. And I just want to bring you guys awareness that We've been past the capacity at the church. We hold 20 beds, and we've been past that limit since the beginning, since it opened up November. So my idea, if you guys consider it, which honestly I really shouldn't have to bring this up because I think it's ridiculous at this point, but I think that there should be emergency vouchers, hotel vouchers in this local area. We have five hotels in this town. There's no reason why these hotels can't help people that's homeless because 211 is not really useful at this point. They've been declining, most of the clients have been trying to stay at the Bethany Church. Um, I know that because I talked to them personally, and even when they get vouchers, it's only reliable in Barrie, which nobody has the transportation needs to get there. So most of the time, these people don't get to go to these vouchers, these hotels. So I'm really hoping that you guys considered collaborating so I don't know the, the budget. I don't know how the money works here. Honestly, I don't know how any of this works. But I really believe that we could have at least emergency housing vouchers with the shelters. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Um, so you were saying that the vouchers are available for hotels in Barry. Yes, two one one does not support Montpelier vouchers. Okay. Yeah. Well, I will confess that that is a part of the law that I don't know either, you know, right. how that voucher money works, but uh, it's an interesting question and I think worth looking into. Well, I just want to let you know that most, there's been a lot of people that's been coming to the, uh, to the Bethany Church over here that mm -hmm. have not been able to stay because we've been past the capacity and most of them get stranded because there's no other solutions. Right. And I feel like there is a lot of hotels in this area that have empty beds that is collecting dust and there's no reason why people can't be staying in these beds. So I just feel like we should be able to work together and f figure this out. Thank you for bringing this up. No, thank uh, you guys. Uh, Donna, can, do you can I ask a question? Yes. Can, can you give us an idea of how many people are turned away because there's not a bed available? Right now, at least over uh, 15 people. Thank you. That's a lot, yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dan Richardson. Uh, I'm resident of Montpelier in the third district and I just had a couple of questions and maybe some comments um, I'll try and keep my 
time brief. Um, first of all, Bill, I had a question for you. We were mentioning in the Green Mountain transportation budget that that could be uh, moved to micro transportation. Um, if you could just define what micro transportation is, and is there a time frame in which that decision would have to be made? Um, I will try, and we have two council members who are actually more informed than I am, but uh, micro transit is basically. Um, I think of it kind of almost like as a public Uber. You can you can call on demand. A vehicle comes and takes you to your place. Uh, there's there's an app that you use. Maybe you'll double up or triple up rides instead of the circulator that just rides around town to be more targeted service. And I know VTrans is studying it pretty carefully along with GMT, and they are talking about rolling it out this year, I think. And I, I believe that in any of their funding conversations they've known that the city's put up 40,000 for the circulator and, and would be willing to convert it to this transit if that's what they wish so okay. that's so what I know I'll let go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, they actually have put a, a grant in to help fund the micro transit so they could really do a broad scope outreach education and branding but they also have made a plan to integrate Hospital Hill and the circulator and the capital shuttle, those funding and those services and those service hours together to really make a much more solid system there that's on demand response instead of a fixed route. Okay. And so I think one way or another, whether it's with the grant or combining all the past funding for these other routes, they're going to try to start the micro, we are going to try to start the micro transit right. in July. Okay. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't an either or type of situation because I think, you know, there is an essential function that the Green Mountain Transport uh, provides in making sure that these key circulator points are hit. And there's a number of people that rely upon them, but as the last speaker indicated, you know, this sort of micro on demand transportation, if they need to get to Barrie to seek shelter or housing, um, you know, can be equally important as well. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that it, it wasn't something that was either or. Um, I'll offer one comment about the homelessness task force uh, funding, which is that I, I've done a lot of work with uh, nonprofit grant funding um, in the legal sector, and this is very common in the first year where you have money available. Task, for, task forces or groups that aren't used to having this funding often need a little bit of creative room to develop. But I think you know the council's correct in looking going forward. What are the results? What are the uses of this money? What are the the productiveness um, results? And I think that's you know second year is when you really have to start to measure it and say what are we what are we putting this money towards? Um, the other question about the master plan funding did that include both um, the uh, budgeting for the uh, consultant as well as public outreach? Or is that is that going to phase in? Are you in? talking about the <laughs> master energy, energy plan? Right. That was for the consultant okay. to, to develop the plan of how we will reach our net zero goals. And then I'm sure we'll recommend more funding and more process after that. Sure. OK. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Laura Rose, um, I had a question about um, the management of the debt service maturity, and this is really um, directed to Bill and his um, counselors who should be looking at this because um, right now I only have audited statements for um, the year ending June 30th, uh, 2018, but in there, it was mentioned that in um, the year ending 2019, the debt for government and business would be 2.3 million. But when you look just five years away, 2024 to 2028, that number is jumping to 7 million uh, 600,000. So in five years, um, we're going to need in our budget an additional $5.3 million to service debt that we already have. And I don't see any planning um, for this. This is a huge change in our debt payments 
and it's only five years away. Bill. Yeah, most of that has to do with the wastewater plant, uh, which is a huge increase and is being offset by uh, fees that are coming in from, out, from new sources. So it has actually been planned. We're going to be doing organic energy and selling uh, as this will be able to take food wastes and things as the state begins to mandate that. And in fact, next meeting we'll be hearing a presentation about the phase two uh, con converting to energy, uh, which um, so these will be the, the payments will be going out, but they'll be offsetting revenues coming in to cover them. Five million in revenues <coughs> increased. Okay, um, I've requested the financial statements. They're still in the box there at the clerk, so I'm just hoping to get some of those before next week's discussion um, because I'm really concerned. Um, I want to see what happened um, in the year ending 2019 about all the accruals in the budget, budget for paying down principal that weren't made, and this is you know, in 2018, I think it's like over $5 million that you allocated but didn't pay. Like, you're making allocations to pay principal, which will reduce the cost in the long run by lowering your interest payments, and you're not making those payments. The money is on the budget, and the money going out is zero. So I'm yeah, we'll piling information that. about that. I'm not sure that's the correct interpretation of those financial statements. We're paying the, the principal and interest payments as due. Um, by the, the bond bank, which is who we borrow our. our I'm just money looking from. at the accredited state, yeah. you know, no, the, the I, statements, I, yeah. and and they're well, not. We'll going have out. our finance folks look at that. And I'm sorry, I don't know the answer off the top of my head. Do you have a request into me? I I do. What could well, you tell uh, me? What that well, is? Well, mainly to finance. I know you've been all in meetings. Oh, um, the finance department. Yeah, I'm sorry. Some some of that. Well, there was a request for you in there too, but anyway. Still I mean, could you tell me what that is? I would like to know. It was a uh, packet for the meeting, but I was able to get it myself. So thank you. Um, I want to look at that though with you. Are you making your principal payments as you're putting them on the budget? Because I don't think you are. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Uh, Connor. More a supposal than a proposal. Um, you know, as I'm looking at the homelessness task force allocation, I, I, I'm definitely comfortable with the amount we're uh, funding there. I, I'm still a little unclear um, about the peer outreach position again. Who are they employed by? Sort of what their specific like duties are. I, I think I get the sense that you know it's a little more meaningful coming from somebody who might have been in this position before. Um, but, but I keep thinking like anything worth doing is worth doing right. And I'm worried about like Barry funding their side of the social worker position. I'm worried about state money coming down for that. And I just want to throw it out there. Like what if we just did a full-time social worker position under the MPD? Um, I'm seeing Zach for <laughs> shake his head here. That we knew exactly what they were doing, who they were reporting to. Um, we would do it right the first year, right off the bat, and there would be some accountability and reporting back to the council on that. I wouldn't see it as a sworn position with a badge or anything, which might make people feel a bit more comfortable. Um, and I, I'm just throwing that out there. I can answer I that. Does that yeah. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not proposing it necessarily. I just want to make sure. No, I mean, so again, Erica Rail, the reason why we proposed a peer support person rather than a social worker is, or an outreach person, is because a lot of people relate to somebody who's had lived experience and not a social worker or letters after their names. Um, a lot of people that have chronic homelessness or have a disability or maybe even a mental health diagnosis would relate to somebody who has had the same experiences rather than a social worker who's been to college, studied, not exactly had the same lived experience. Um, for example, somebody like Don or myself who have, have um, a lived experience of homelessness or a mental health diagnosis. We may have relate to somebody who's been out there on the streets. A person might have trust issues with a social worker or a mandated reporter. 
and we might be able to make a, a peer worker or a street outreach person might make a connection, whereas a social worker might not make that connection. Um, we are currently researching um, job descriptions of peer outreach workers, talking to other organizations who have hired um, outreach workers. Um, we know there's been outreach workers hired in Burlington, Brattleboro, Bennington. Um, so we haven't, you know, really narrowed down a job description, who they'd fall under, et cetera. Some people have done it under um, Vermont Psychiatric Survivors. Some have done it under Howard Center. So we haven't narrowed the focus down yet, but we are working on it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I guess, like, when do you think we'll have a little more clarity on this? It's we will have more clarity on this. Um, this is brand new. It's a, you know, Burlington did it as a pilot project. Uh, four years ago, um, and they're still working on getting out the kinks. So we're, I'm not a big fan of reinventing wheels, um, so we're looking at what different things happen. Every town in Vermont is different, so we're trying to see what works. Dawn's been doing it a long time, so we're trying to take her lived experience of doing this pro bono and what works for my player. Dawn, did you have something to add? Um, Dawn Little again. I'd like to say first that it is entirely possible to build accountability into a street outreach position. That, that really shouldn't be a problem. Um, the reason we haven't given you the details, we don't know who would be hosting the program, and the focus may depend on, well, okay, more thorough as assessment of exactly who is out there and of what the, for instance, what Bethany, what the overflow looks like in the future what changes are made in the 211 system so that our responsiveness fund may be able to be used to match that. That might affect things. But it, it can be tailored pretty much to the needs of this community. Um, and I would also like to say that the in the past, some of the people that I have brought in to fill out the forms to go through the process to get housing and have subsequently gotten housing have specifically, in fact, many of them have specifically said to me, we don't think this is going to work. We have no faith in this. This is garbage. We are doing this because you want us to do it. And so a lot of this is about relationship and, you, and about going out and finding the people. You know, Because if you wait for them to come to you, it's not going to happen. It, it's already not happened for these people for years. I mean, the, the existing system has not worked, or they wouldn't have been out there for years. So it's sort of, I guess part of the position is, facilitating the access to the existing systems in whatever way it needs to happen. And I don't know, I think a social worker is a great link in that, especially when people come in contact with the police. But I do think in terms of going out and finding people and gaining their trust, um, I, I think you need an outreach worker of some kind. And I think people who have had bad experiences with the system are a lot more likely to trust someone they consider to be a peer. But the accountability can be can be tailored to the situation. Just Thank saying. you, uh, Donna. Well, I remember making that motion, and the idea was the forty-five thousand dollars and no specific line items, and then we were going to work with the homeless task force, give them more time to right. form everything out. Yeah. So I just want to go back to that. So I may put them in a place where they didn't expect to present more detail because I'm not expecting it now. I think part of it is that since we don't know who's going to host the program, we don't know what type of administrative structure is going to be, you know, we do need to find someone who's willing to host it or it needs to be subcontracted, which is also a viable possibility, which might yeah. actually reduce administrative costs if you subcontracted it. And you right. could also build accountability into that. But, but depending on the host, that's going to, the structure will vary in terms of the accountability and the, you know, the breakdown of the hours probably. But you know, it's adaptable. Okay. Thank you. And forgive me, can I just say um, Yeah, no, and I mean, what you're saying, what Dan is saying. Um, you want to introduce yourself? Oh, sorry. It's okay. Uh, my name is Ken Russell. I live in District 1, and, um, and my streets are nice. <laughs> uh, the winter parking ban hasn't affected me. Yeah. No. Um, <laughs> um, no, seriously though, we've done. We're talking to a lot of people, understanding the lay of the land, um, the continuum of care. Who was run through Capstone? Tony Grout was at that meeting the other day. 
they're talking very much the same language, very much the same things. Statewide level, we're at the state house today. They're talking about. I mean, this is not. This is not just pulling something out of midair. There, this is this is the zeitgeist. This is what people are thinking about. As Don said, yeah, there 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 are structures of accountability. You, we will come back to you soon. And yes, we we heard Councillor Bate say, you know, come back. Um, and I checked in with people that we, you know we had a little bit of time, but we're not slouching on this. And and what you know, having a good solid professional program that really makes a difference is something we're very interested in. So, thanks. Great, thank you. Um, Steve Whitaker again. The, uh, you hear these words, continuum of care and homeless management information system. Uh, I had encouraged before the task force first met, I sent a memo out saying we really need to focus on the privacy dimensions of these services we're trying to learn to provide. The state has not done that. The state has a task force that's supposed to coordinate the homeless management information system and deal with privacy policies. That board has fallen apart, hasn't met in a year or two. And here we are like, sure, let's jump in and give everybody's personal information to this you know, system. We're all on board and speaking the same language. We need to pause and step back and decide whether we're encouraging folks to put data in unsecure hands where you, it may come back to haunt you. Um, independent contractor is a proper low overhead way to handle the street outreach. I think a half-time person, I think somebody like Don could work three hours a day and save up, book, book the extra hour for the on-call emergencies. You know, that's, that's a about the level of service that we need right now. We, uh, we need to fund, you. y'all need to decide whether you want to fundamentally begin now to intercept the OEO money. I'm hoping that Bill has made efforts. I've asked to talk to Bill before he talks to Sarah Phillips at OEO, but it's important that we keep our options open in case Bethany is not an option for next winter, that we have control over our share of that 500,000 that Good Sam currently <coughs> takes. It doesn't mean we couldn't contract with Good Sam to run a shelter if another church opens up, but it means we need to keep our options open. Uh, we need to focus one of the tasks you should give your task force and or the outreach worker. It's important they be independent is accountability. We've got drug dealing going on right outside of another way currently. We've got people tweaking it at other shelters too that are managed. That, there, there are problems that need oversight, uh, and I know you want to argue that they're just fine and, you know, good salmon another way don't, can do no wrong, but that's just not true. We've got real problems there, and we need to decouple and take a real strong look at how much more we invest in that. Uh, how much money is in the budget for public, for public works investments catching up? $2.4 million total is is a farce compared to what I'm seeing going to hell in, a, in, in this town. So we need to think about, I know it's late in the budget process, but I'm asking you to really consider whether we might need twice that amount. Uh, how much is in the budget for garage appeals? Let's say it's very likely that the opponents could prevail. Uh, are we prepared to take it? Is the city prepared to take it to the Supreme Court? I suspect they are. It, have you budgeted several hundred thousand dollars for appeals on that garage? How much is it worth and when do you start making a contingency plan? The State House today took up parking and there was great interest in the Senate, among a number of parties in the Senate of Ops, to pursuing the pit as an alternative. Um, Chief Fakos was there for part of that. And, and I think we're, we're remiss in not exploring our other options and creating a contingency plan rather than dumping good money after bad on a poorly planned and poorly processed uh, garage design. Thank you. Zach, do you have something? I want to say something. One more. Yeah. Well, while we're setting Zach up, I just wanted to add a comment for, for Connor and others just to be clear. The social worker that we're proposing actually will not be a, a 
MPD employee. They will be an employee of Washington County Mental Health. Mm -hmm. We'll have an arrangement with the two police departments and just so you know. Uh, so I, I will say this again. I want to answer these questions. So this has actually uh, been done before um, the street outrage was done um, under um, another way through Good Samaritan several years ago. It was done under a very small grant. Um, so there was accountability done. I was on that team along with Rick DeAngelis and we had to submit data and hours every week. Um, so we were very accountable to what we do. I still have that data in my system in my house. Um, so I, I mean, the accountability um, goes with any profession. I have accountability at my work. I'm, you know, and I'm peer worker there, and I'm supposed to submit uh, logs when I work and hours. So it doesn't go away. Uh, we don't know who would host that because we don't know <laughs> if this has been approved yet. So once that happens, we would we would be able to figure out who's going to host this. Um, and I think that everybody could work together because I don't think. I mean, it's all, it sounds like a great idea on paper, Connor. Uh, social workers full time, we got this in the bag, and that's all good, but it really doesn't really pan out that way. I wish it did. We could make it simple. Um, it just does. In fact, I understand that we were, we were sharing this social worker, unless you guys were looking to hire another social worker on top of that. Um, but in any, any case, I kind of want to stay away from the social worker, except to link up maybe. And um, so I just wanted to let you know that. And I wanted to answer a quick question about the hotels. We acknowledge that this is an issue about getting people to the hotels. Um, I could tell you that it depends on who the hotels contract with. Uh, they contract with, you know, they do work through ESD. The funding streams to the hotels. Depends who ESD is doing work with. Most of the hotels are in Barrie. So, you know, at one time we had one in Montpelier. I don't know if we're still doing that one. And also, people going into the overflow have been determined, maybe may have been determined, or may not have been, depending on the situation, they may have been determined um, not eligible for the hotel because there's a maybe a bed at overflow. It's possible, but if overflow turned them away, theoretically, yeah, they call 211. There's always a chance of a glitch there. And, you know, the, the 15 people would definitely go without. One of those 15 would, you know, something like that would go without. Um, it is possible, but I just want to answer about the hotels because that's, that's done through, you know, contract with the SD or Agency of Human Services. Um, I believe the Econo Lodge at one time, or the old Econo Lodge up here, used to be one of those hotels, but I don't think that's the case right now. So I just want to say we'll continue this work you guys sent us on, and we appreciate the extra time, and we'll keep you guys updated. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Hi, my name is Nancy Smith. I live in District 1, and the homelessness uh, problem around here it really concerns me on a daily basis. I lose sleep over it. Um, and I'm just trying to figure out what's going on, so I really don't know a lot about what's going on. But as an employee of Washington County Mental Health, I have to say that as soon as I became an employee of Washington County Mental Health, my friends who are, live closer to the street immediately started to say things like, uh, oh, you've gone to work for the enemy, or things like that. They're definitely afraid of Washington mental health. And so I still think that when they're talking about some sort of a liaison that is a peer, that's very important. There's got to be somebody approachable. They're not going to approach somebody from Washington County mental health. So I think you should be aware of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hey, again. Um, I just want to kind of forward what Steve Willeker was kind of saying and Zachary. Um, I just want to make it clear. How many of you guys know that the NES it's a subsidized housing on Berry Street. It is owned by um, Good Samaritan Haven, and I think it's about 
I think 10 beds available at that place. Now the issue with uh, the nest, what I want to bring up is that you're not qualified to be at the nest unless you have stayed at the Good Samaritan Haven for 60 days at least. And remind you that the Good Samaritan <laughs> Haven is at, at past capacity, about 25 beds. And anybody that's staying at the Bethany Church is not qualified to stay at the Good Samaritan Haven because it's, or, it's already past capacity. So, and the, the mission statement of the NES is for people to like get a job, um, you know, save money, get um, housing in the future. So I just want to bring that awareness that the system is kind of has a lot of flaws behind it, and I'm hoping that you guys could help fix that in the future. I don't know. So that's all I want to say. Thank you. Do you know who actually operates the nest? Good who operates the nest? It's a good Samaritan. Is it, is it it's operated owned by the Good, good Samaritan. Samaritan. Okay. Yeah, okay. that's I all I know. I, yeah. I wasn't sure if it was a separate. Thank you. Oh, no. Thank yeah, you. sure. Okay, all right, well, thank you all. Um, and so I'll close the uh, public hearing on that. Um, any <coughs> further comments from council? Oh, okay, fair enough. Um, so we will have another public hearing on, on this uh, on the 23rd. Do you need a motion for that? I'm, gonna, I'm looking at you. You don't need to unless you're changing the budget number, no. which it didn't sound like you are. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Thank you all. Um, so we're going to move on to um, the uh, warning of the annual meeting. Um, so for this, we have the attached uh, potential draft of the, the warning. Um, so is there anything, I, I mean, I have some assumptions about this, but uh, <laughs> is there anything you want to uh, either of you want to start out with for this? I just mentioned that obviously, as per usual, it's kind of a placeholder warning that we get last minute changes, we get last minute money information in there. So this is more of a, as much of anything as a legal formality to make sure it's, mm -hmm. it's in correct. It's also a chance for our citizens to ask about anything that's on it if they didn't understand. You should open the public hearing. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so I'm going to open the public hearing on the warning. Thank you. Um, one question I have is, um, uh, based on our conversation previously, I wonder if we would be removing Article 12. Um, yes. Well, assuming I, that's the decision, yes. That's what I took that's away. That's what I, yes. I feel like I heard that earlier. Is that, is that fair? I didn't hear a motion to put it on, so I guess that's. Right. Because it's not in there, so we didn't need to take a motion to take it. Well, it's on the, it is on, on the draft. The, the draft warning, warning, Article Twelve for. But, but it's not. I didn't think it was in our budget number. It's not. Okay. That's okay. <coughs> right. So, do you need a motion to remove? I move it? to delete Article Twelve from the proposed warning. Why not be safe? I'll make a motion to remove Article Twelve from the current. Oh, well, you want a second, Jacks? Fine. Fine. Second, Jack. Okay. Here we go. All right, uh, further discussion on that part of it. Uh, one question I have about that, I, I think it goes without saying that all the other articles would move up a number. <laughs> okay. Uh, Unless right. you put in a new Article 12. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, replacement Article 12. Any, any further uh, converse, uh, conversation about Article 12? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No? Okay. Just along those lines, though, would we have this article if we did the loan to pay back the state? That could go in there. Okay. Okay. Anything else on here? Well, I, I actually do have another question. Um, uh, so this is about Article 14, uh, the CVPSA. Uh, so uh, I'm going to direct this at you, Donna. I hope that's okay. Um, my understanding of the MOU with Barry currently is that um, we have this split between costs that's um, 4753 50 yeah right and so it would be it would reduce the city's portion to like tw I had it here 23 five would make Montpelier 23,500 instead of 25,000 even. I hesitated to bring it up earlier because the 
Public Safety Authority Board meets tomorrow evening and will modify its own um, warning notice at its public hearing on its warning notice is tomorrow night. So is it That's what it's likely to be because the current MO, MOU, a memo of understanding on the share costing formula is the 5347. So uh, I have a question about that. Um, uh, do we need to have another he public hearing on the warning? We're um, having next, it next week. Anyway. Next week. So we, we could change that. We could change it. We could propose a, a change tonight, and okay. then you'll have your meeting, and we can revisit it next week. Okay. Or not next week, the 23rd. Yeah, that's next week. Next week. Oh, it is next week. Yeah, oh, it's gosh. next week. It's boom, boom. So you'd like me to make the motion tonight? I just feel hesitant because the board itself hasn't changed its initial warning. It will do so tomorrow night. I think we should, knowing that we could change sure. it back if we needed to, but just fine, to, fine. To I'll be we recognize the MOU as having a different percentage. Absolutely. Right. Okay. So oh, uh, before you do that, uh, Stephen, you have something to say? Uh, I want to just call to your attention that they're also trying to make progress on a contract to get something that's credible as a plan that will attract new members and other funding sources. And you're missing a delegate since Ashley's resignation. So it's important. I don't know the process of how whether you have to advertise that or you can appoint somebody in the interim. Uh, but you need another vote. Montpelier needs another vote on that board, potentially as early as tomorrow night. Um, so. There, there is a lot at stake because there's things are moving at the state level on uh, dispatch arrangements. And if, if we're not going to lose our entire investment in CVPSA, we, we, we need to be riding on top of it, as I've been saying for a year and a half or so. <laughs> so if you're at liberty to appoint somebody, you should do that. Thank you. Uh, did you want to? Did you want to make a motion? Uh, I was. You, I was going to make a motion to change Article 14 now on the existing warning that the amount would be twenty three thousand five hundred from Montpelier and twenty six five hundred from Barry City. The total fifty thousand remains the same. There's a second. Further discussion on this particular item? Uh, Donna, go ahead. There is actually going to be some additional warning because it's for a, a study, so we can name it. That's a telecommunication study plan. And so I've offered some warning, and we'll finalize it tomorrow night again. So this won't be the exact warning, but the numbers I'm supplying is the 2347. OK. Great. Thank you. Thanks for that clarification, and thanks for um, you know looking out for us. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, further discussion. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And is are there any of the other numbers that we need to change? Anything else that needs to be revisited here? No, we don't have the final school numbers yet either, and I mean this. We probably well, we've got to change this by fifteen hundred dollars now for. Which one? Oh, never mind. No, because that's not the debt. Nope. Never okay. mind. Okay. Anything? Anything else? Anything else we should flag for this? Okay. Any com any further comments from the public on the morning? Okay. So I'm going to close the public hearing, uh, and uh, based on that. Because there were some changes, I think we probably should have a motion f to set the next hearing for next week. I think it's already been warned anyway, but yes. Oh, okay. It doesn't matter. I, I move we schedule a second public hearing on the uh, proposed uh, town city meeting warning, uh, incorporating the changes we made tonight. A second. Okay, further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, great. Thank you. And... Um, all right, so we have one more regular business item this evening, um, which is uh, the first public hearing on uh, proposed amendments to the dog ordinance. So uh, I'm going to open the public hearing. I'm killing it tonight with the opening public meetings. Uh, remembering, yeah. OK, so um, uh, 
for this, um, either Bill or Donna, would you like to explain um, these changes? Uh, probably Donna or Cameron. <laughs> okay. The wording that's now being proposed is reflected exactly what's stated in the noise. And Cameron did the research to show that indeed other towns in their dog ordinances keeps this broad instead of 20 minutes or 30 minutes, and, and it works very well. Add your comments. Well, um, that's really the whole and some of my comments is that this uh, <laughs> <laughs> really does realign our language that's consistent throughout all of our ordinances. And in all the study that I did do, um, other organizations really don't put time limits, and it allows um, a certain amount of flexibility within the ordinance. Um, and uh, the league also does not really recommend putting time limits in there as well. So um, if it helps, I can read it aloud, the proposed changes again, if you'd like. Um, I think it would, sure, let's, let, just for clarity. Okay, so we only edited um, one section in Article 2, Dog and Animal Control Ordinance. It's Section 8. 202 definitions number eight. So it says nuisance shall mean any dog or domestic pet that chronically disturbs the quiet, comfort, and repose of others by frequent or continued barking, howling, yelping, or screaming. This definition shall not apply to dogs in a kennel or boarding facility which has received a zoning permit under the city's zoning regulations or working farm dogs that are barking in order to herd or protect livestock or poultry or to protect crops. This also, nuisance dogs also mean anyone that causes damage to property. Cool. Any comments? Uh, oh, yeah. I did hear from some of the neighbors that had talked from Elm Street, and they couldn't be here tonight, but they wanted to say they really were in favor of this ordinance and hope that it passes. Great. Any other comments? Uh, Connor. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd support this. I, I had a few emails on it, and I, I think what I've been telling constituents is I don't see this as being draconian or any more strict than the pre-existing language. I, I think it's just a, a matter of clarity and realigning, as uh, Cameron says, with some of the other cities. So um, I have no problem with it. Great. Jack, did you have something? And then we'll go to. Uh, I favor this. I think this is a good idea. I. Uh, as it happened, I circulated the video of the first meeting in which we discussed this to everybody in my family because that was the night we also had the presentation on the Emerald Ash Borer. And every time I talk to my sister, who lives in New Jersey since then, she says, "Did those poor people ever get help with their with the problem with the dogs?" Um, so uh, I'm I'm certainly going to be supporting this. <laughs> um, Laura. Okay. Um, I just, um, I didn't really hear the background from November as to why this is on the table now. Donna? Oh, we received some complaints from some neighbors, and when they went to try to enforce a chronic barking, howling dog, the police found this discrepancy between what is said about a dog nu nuisance under the dog ordinances and what we said about dogs in the noise ordinance. So we were just trying to make them mirror one another. I, I see. I, I guess my concern is that um, it could open up neighbors holding other neighbors accountable in a way that, that could just be really bad. Um, like the neighbor across the street's cat runs across the yard and that makes the other neighbor's dog bark, but the people who own the cat call the police, that kind of thing. I, I just, the, the difference for me um, with a dog versus, you know, people playing their music too loud or things like that is that a dog um, often vocalizes maybe when they're happy or they're tangled or, you know, a dog is off you know, on their property or something like that. Um, when you just say frequent or continued, there's no, you know, it's like saying like, okay, well this dog is loud. It's like saying, well, the neighbors downstairs have kids and I don't wanna hear them. Um, I mean, dogs should be allowed to vocalize somewhat and I'm just afraid this could be too strict. And some of the research was like, 
Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, I looked at the packet for the research. But some of it was really urban, with much larger populations, higher density than what we experience in a town of only you know, 8,000 people. So maybe you could speak to that. Um, I don't have my packet in front of me, but my research um, tried to be regional, other cities. There are some comparable benchmark communities in there as well. And I used the Vermont uh, League of Cities and Towns recommendation as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other um, comments? Okay. Um, so, anything, uh, since you're still Could here, I anybody still speak to the you know neighbor versus neighbor and how the police have, are going to deal with this? We have any this? number like of maybe how is it going to affect the police? Sure. I, I you know I think I'll let the police answer to this, but we you know we have a lot of situations where there's neighbor disputes and. Certainly if a dog is a one-off barking because they're tangled or something, they're not going to get cited under the ordinance. I mean, this is really intended to be, you know, night after night after night uh, type thing, which is what the neighbors were experiencing, but they weren't actually barking for 20 minutes straight. So that was the, the conflict with the ordinance. I guess my concern is we were talking about like um, preserving kind of the intent of the law when it was written, and this really doesn't do it. I mean, the intent was really that <coughs> Um, it was going on and on, and now there's no allowance for that. It does say frequent it, and it, continued. It says chronically. It says or. Chronically yeah, disturbing frequent or by frequent and continued barking. It says or. I do want to also point out that the penalties for a lot of this is um, restorative process with our um, community justice center. Okay. So we do um, ask people, other than just fining people, you can get a fine or you can go through a restorative process where our um, community justice center really sits down with neighbors and tries to get to the core of the dispute. Because um, I think you're drawing a point of a lot of times if disputes um, get to this level, it's because of something other than a dog, right? Sometimes. sometimes. And so sometimes um, this, we really try to help people sit down and talk about it. And so that it doesn't get to this level or over again. Or result yeah. in a call to the police right. department so we who don't has involve other them, right. business to mm -hmm. right. handle. So we, we try, uh, I think we try to address that in this ordinance as well. Thank you, Cameron. Uh, Donna. In fact, that's a great point because that's what the neighbors tried to do, but they had no muscle to make the people come to the Justice Center and sit down for mediation. And so this gets that step in place so people talk. But you write it as or. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Uh, any further comments on this? Now you close the public okay, hearing. Okay, I'm going to close the public hearing. And yeah, I'm Donna. Make a mo motion for the second hearing on the dog ordinance changes to be the next meeting, which is January 23rd. Yes. Second. Further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so that is all of our regular business for this evening. Uh, so now we're going to go to uh, council reports. Uh, Donna, I'm just so used to starting with you. Is, is okay. that okay? okay? Well, I had a lot of regional planning commission meetings, and the Clean Basin made a uh, petition to the the regional. The Clean Basin plan is a subcommittee out of the Central Vermont Regional Basin regional planning commission and w the report was done and the basin plan was approved the f very first of 2019 but the committee felt it was some concerns not addressed and so indeed we're doing this letter and I realize I've been on the clean water basin plan really more as a citizen so if indeed I shouldn't use my title Montpelier City Council I'd like to know that before we send this letter <laughs> Uh, so I maybe should have put that on the agenda. I was doing this report and realized, oh, uh, we are sending this letter. They are putting our sort of our associated groups. Uh, and so maybe I shouldn't be saying I'm from Montpelier City Council. Um, so what's, what's your timeline on sending that letter? Oh, and it's not till next month. So we can talk about the next meeting yeah. evening, but I thought I'd sure. put it out there and I can send you a copy of the letter and That'd be great. give you more about it. Okay. Uh, but it's just saying we like these concerns that we're missing in the final plan. Uh, the other thing is Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission had a multimodal group 
Now, I got into this group late, and I was really concerned that it's doing its thing, and we had this microtransit group, and then you had this wonderful meeting of a lot of regional transportation. So we, we are trying to get, what's one of the things they're trying to do is pull all these groups together and look beyond Montpelier and to help communities that can't think of putting transit on the bus, but could do some of the other ideas. So I would like to join this group too, but you know, you could decide whether I'm there on your behalf. I can just keep you posted. Uh, they're trying to cr create a new name for itself, but it'll be meeting and trying to destroy silos, basically, on transportation. So keep cool. tuned. Cool. Uh, had a good meeting yesterday with the uh, Vermont River Conservancy. They had some questions. It actually scared the hell out of me. The prospect of taking out some of the three dams there, you know, and <coughs> killing, killing us all in Montpelier. Uh, so I had a lot of questions, and they were able to really give me the 101 sort of Fisher Price uh, rundown of it. Um, and, you know, and just really looking at what these dams were initially intended for, whether it be hydropower or flood mitigation. Um, the three ones they're talking about the Pioneer Dam, the Bailey Dam, and the Rat Dam over there. Uh, really haven't been maintained. They're not really serving any functional purpose anymore. And actually, they could be a real liability for us if one of them pops there. So um, I, I think in the next coming couple meetings, they might be asking us for a letter of support to pull down some DEC uh, funding to actually do a feasibility study of these dams and see, do we do nothing? Do we take them out? Is it something in between? Uh, but I think there's enormous potential just looking at Confluence Park and sort of the river access we have over by Bar Hill now uh, to put in some kayaking, other recreational activities in addition to, I guess if you, you know, take out some of these dams, like some of the fish population jumps up, some of these wildlife habitats are restored, um, and if you're not going in a straight line, you can really sort of slow down the flow of the river naturally by letting a river be a river. So um, anyways, if anybody wants to sit down with them, I'm sure Ricarda. Uh, and Steve would be more than happy to, but it was a real eye-opener for me, and uh, I, I'd be happy to introduce that letter of support in a couple of meetings, sir. That's it for me. Can, Thanks. Yeah, keep us posted on that. Did, did you say the rat dam? It was a rat, the rat dam. dam. I think it was initially intended to cover a big sewage pipe um, back in the day there, uh, but now that we have a wastewater treatment plant, that's uh, not the case anymore. So it's, where's, we don't where's have to hide that? All the it's on North the beach. North Branch. It's, you can see it from the new pedestrian bridge. Okay. Uh, it's, or actually, you might not be able to. It might be directly over it, or it's just barely upstream of it. I'm not sure. Okay. I don't recall it yet. It's right there, though. Um, I'm looking forward to Martin Luther King Day weekend coming up. It's a, a significant holiday for my family. Um, I kind of use that as the, the chance to go down and visit my folks because it's hard to get away at Christmas. Uh, so just wanted to mention that and use it to uh, make my excuse to Bill. I'm not going to see you next week, I suppose. We'll be closed, we'll be closed anyway. Um, I will be at Baguito's tomorrow morning, of course, 8.30 to 9.30. Uh, I also want to mention uh, Ken Russell uh, referenced it briefly. There was a... a a vigil and a rally uh, at the State House today that I got to see just a little bit of uh, around homelessness statewide and um, uh, possible solutions for it. It was, uh, as these things are, uh, affecting, um, depressing, and uh, invigorating kind of all at once. And um, I was glad I was there. I was sorry I couldn't be there for the whole thing. Um, and. I feel like there was something else, but I can't remember it now, so I'll pass. I'll pass. Um, just one quick update from the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee that there continues to be progress on fleshing out and refining in request for a proposal um, for that. So thank you all again for the allocation in the budget. And shout out to Cameron, who's been working really hard and doing some great work pulling that together. Um, so thank you to Cameron for that. And um, look forward to sharing you uh, with you when we get to a final version of that. Okay, so I have a, a couple of things here. Um, so uh, one is uh, I'm going to be hosting some office hours uh, right next door here uh, in, the, uh, in City Hall. 
uh, Tuesday, uh, 21st, 3.30 to 4.30. Um, I'm going to try to make that regular. I know I've said that in the past, but I'm going to be there next Tuesday. That's going to happen. Um, so that, at least that's, that is my plan. So I'll be there next Tuesday, 21st, uh, 3.30, 4.30, taking a cue from Glenn here. It's, good, it's a good practice. Um, uh, just a reminder to the council, um, if you would please um, uh, remind or uh, please remember to fill out uh, Bill's evaluation form. Um, I think we have uh, that review coming up. Uh, I forget what day we said it would be on, but uh, I think before this meeting, I was the only one who yet filled it out. So um, <laughs> please. Can you give us a deadline? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll send an email of a deadline. I'll look at when it makes sense to. Didn't you this say weekend. the 12th? You wanted to do it by the 12th? So we need it before the 12th? then. Well, uh, no, we were going to do it at the meeting of the 12th. That's when we were going to do the review. So it should probably be done by the Friday before. At least. At least. But one of the problems with it, you have to fill it all out at once. Because I started yes. it and realized I couldn't save it. So I'm doing it offline. OK. But. Yep, fair enough. Thank you. It is, it is it's a long well, form. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, OK. Uh, so that is um, second thing. And then just a third thing, just a heads up about the uh, energy efficiency, home energy labeling uh, uh, ordinance coming up. We've, we're aiming to have the language uh, done by the 12th for the 12th um, to have some preliminary information um, or a, a potentially even like a first uh, reading potentially at, on that date. Um, and so we'll have the language available uh, potentially before that. So if anyone would like to see it um, for that, we we're going to finalize that language probably in the next uh, week or so. Uh, so yeah, it's exciting to see that uh, moving forward or uh, getting to be at least clearer, which is great. All right, that's it for me. Um, John. Uh, just a reminder that if you have uh, ballot questions, to get them to me by 5 o'clock next Thursday. That is not the candidate filing deadline. The candidate filing deadline is 5 o'clock the following Monday. So we will need to set a Board of Civil Authority meeting for that day to uh, draw lots. will not have to be a formal action, so we won't need a, a, uh, a quorum. Um, also, I just received notification today that uh, the non-citizen voting uh, charter change proposal was actually released by Senate uh, Rules Committee, and GovOps is going to take it up next Tuesday at 3.15. The Senate um, GovOps? I'm sorry, Senate GovOps is going to take it up, yeah. Okay. Wow. Uh, sorry, what time was that again? It's at 3.15 Tuesday. And I the will, 21st? Uh, yes. Yeah, I have office hours. <laughs> <laughs> Going to the office hours. Oh, gosh. Well, well, if, yeah, exactly. Let's. Well, I will be testing. I'll, I'll, I'll be able to go. You'll be able to go? No. And John, you're going to go? Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm on the list Great. to test. To, to find just, I would just rem remind folks that the way it went last year was that Senate GovOps assumed, as per normal procedure, that they were going to uh, get this last uh, the last session, so they preemptively held hearings for it. So that's when we called out everybody, you know, we can, the attorneys we'd spoken to, the city clerks in other you know cities in the country who had done this. Um, so the committee has heard a lot of that already. I'll, I'll try to gently remind them, but this is a smaller list that they've set up, and I'm not inclined to necessarily go and shake the bushes and the trees given that. Want to warm up. <laughs> <laughs> Is that it for you? Yeah, that's yeah. it. I'm done. Great. Bill? Um, no, we've been you know knee deep with all sorts of things. I don't have anything specific new other than uh, in addition to the candidate filing, remind people that the deadline, if you wish to be considered for appointment for the interim position, is this Friday. Uh, at the end of the day, we, to my knowledge, we have two people that have submitted applicants so far. There may be more, but that, I, I am sure of two. So that will be on the agenda. Uh, I don't know if we want to talk about early start to get that done before we do everything else next week. There's our boards. We can look at what's on. I'm trying to think of like how busy the 23rd's agenda is. So we have, um, well, finalizing the budget and the warning. I guess we don't have bond, well, make a decision perhaps about the, the land repayment. Um, 
we were going to have a presentation on the wastewater plant, the phase two. Dog ordinance, second reading. Budget, second hearing. Budget, second hearing. Um, trying to think what else was on that list. Um, so, I mean, it's not nothing. Yeah, why don't we do it at six? Are, are people available to be here at six o'clock? Um, I wonder if we should make the appointment at six o'clock. And because some of these things are public hearings, people might not expect to, I don't know how fast that conversation will be. Um, and so if it is. Um, well, yeah, I, I meant to start to do the appointment the very first thing. Right, exactly. If we did the appointment first at but, 6, uh, but then um, not start other business until at least 6.30. Correct. And I was basing this on at least prior times when the applicants have come in and made a presentation. Sometimes yeah. people have spoken on their behalf. Yeah. Council has gone into executive session. Sometimes it takes longer than others. Uh, so I'm thinking it's going to be at least a half an hour before we get into the regular business. So, uh, but then again, it could take five minutes for all I know. So, so I, I, I'm okay with that. How do you all feel? Well, I feel if we allow just that much time and we need more, we can move it. We can extend it to. To another part of the meeting if we have to you, you can although i think well it's your call i think the intent was to appoint the I, person I at the beginning. i'm just saying if we got yep. suddenly end up with four people it might be more complicated that's all that we could extend it um can I do something? yeah i i might be a minute or two late for a six o'clock meeting but i'll make it as soon as i can wouldn't be more than you know 605 you could start without me any thoughts and we'll let the we'll let the applicants know as well. So, do we do we need a motion to that effect? Uh, we've never. You, we're okay. just setting the meeting. We're setting to, this, okay. Uh, and I think it would probably be important to not take up any other business prior to six thirty, so that right anybody who you know Correct. shows up for these other Except items approving is not the agenda. What's that? Except approving the agenda. Sure. <laughs> None of the substantial. Yeah. yeah. No, I gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. In fact, to that end, we might want to put the consent agenda after. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. General uh, business, all of that. Right. So, okay. And that, is that it for you? That was it for me. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, that's that's everything. So without objection, we will uh, adjourn. Eight thirty-eight.